and over again. <laughs> he says, Tatiana Troianos, Tatiana Troianos. It's like an incantation because he finds so much beauty in the sound of those syllables. Uh -huh. And Mr. Canard would like to know, were you named after the heroine Tatiana in Tchaikovsky's opera, Eugene Onegin? Well, I was not. No, I was named after my father's sister. <laughs> and, uh, my father comes from a rather large island uh, called Cephalonia, Cephalonia. However, when I was born, it was not his intention to name me Tatiana. He wanted my name to be Panayutitsa. Panayutitsa means uh, a little Madonna. And if I would have been given that name. I don't think I would have survived in this country <laughs> with that. And I think eventually then I would have been called Patricia. My mother, on the other hand, as far as I recall, wanted to name me Charlotte. And I think that came from a place in Stuttgart where she was born as uh, Charlottenplatz. And I think that name oh, she always felt was very lovely. But I, real, I feel very lucky that they finally decided on Tatiana because I think it is a beautiful name. It is, and you know, your aunt might have been after Onegin, and uh, your mother might have been influenced by Fairter and Charlotte. I would like to say, though, coming to the old Met, you know, as a young girl, when I heard Richard Tucker sing the part of Lenski, and he would sing that, of course, that opera was performed in English, mm. and he would sing about Tatiana, then I was thrilled that that was my name. <laughs> Addressed directly to you. That's right. That's yes. it. Yep. All right. Our next question points out that you just recently had an enormous <clears throat> success in a concert performance of Handel's Aria Dante here in New York. Yes. And this causes Larry P. Bauer of Cleveland, Ohio, to wonder which you find more satisfying a fully staged performance of an opera, complete with costumes, spectacular sets, and lighting, or a straightforward concert performance where all you have to do is concentrate solely on the music? They're both tremendously satisfying. Let me just say that at the very outset. There is definitely a physical freedom that comes with stage performances. I mean, after all, you have, you have the sets, the props, the costumes, your other colleagues, the distance also. It makes the dramatic approach easier to portray. The pleasure in singing concert performances is in standing still and singing, using your voice to get as many expressions and colors across as you can, bringing the words out into the forefront. And because there's nothing visual to aid you except that, and it's a tremendous challenge. You find it more difficult? I do. But at the same time, it's more satisfying, I would think, because you are you know, Richard, on your own. You're on one-to-one -one basis with the audience. Yes, that's true. That's true. But still, it's an opera, you know, and you have to make it come alive. And the other thing is, is that usually, like the other night when we did Ario Dante, we only did one performance. When you're singing a group of uh, um, performances, let's say Clemenza di Tito, and you have 13 performances, you know, they're all different. They all vary. You grow. You, you, you work out something. You, you, become, you become engrossed in a different way. The growth is, is, is expansive, I think. Yes. And you don't have that chance in a concert performance. It's that one performance. And every time you come out on the stage, there, your concentration has to be extraordinary. And there has to just be a few very definite ideas in your head when you come out that you want to portray. That's what's very important. And you have to hold the public with that. And I, it's, a very, it's a great challenge. And I There's love doing sort both. sort of a medium thing, too. It's not exactly a compromise between the two things. But occasionally there are stage performances where there is modified uh, movement and action. That's is, correct. Is that an addition or um, something that just is a further annoyance in a stage per concert performance? That's an interesting question. I, um, I'm, I'm all for bringing the opera, making it as alive as possible. However, one doesn't want any distractions. One doesn't want anything that's not necessary. You know, that mm. the individual artist can bring across with his own ability. You know? Yes. So we don't want fussiness of any kind, you know. It's better if it's concert performance to just line it out. If it's operatic performance, you act and emote and sing up a storm that's simultaneously. Right. Yes, that's right. It's not saying that when uh, you're doing a concert performance that you're not totally involved in the character. You are. Yes. 
you know. It can even be more concentrated Absolutely. because you're head on with Absolutely. the audience all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, good. That takes care of that subject. <laughs> That's a good, good question. Right. Now, William H. Hewlett of Miami, Florida, would like to know if there is a difference involved in vocal technique when you sing German opera and when you sing an Italian opera. You have been acclaimed for many years in both German and Italian opera. And Mr. Hewlett would like to know if there is a difference, can you explain what it is? Well, I'd like to say that the biggest difference in German and Italian technique is the language. I cannot stress that enough. Music is written to fit the language. The language changes the color and determines the shape of the line. The legato is broken by the consonants in German. Now, one has to be aware of that all the time. You know, one, one has to understand what the artist is saying, singing on stage. And when you're singing a German role, okay, you know that there are many consonants. So you have to get to those vowels too, because after all, you are singing this, you know. Mm. But you have to make sure that you enunciate clearly because you also have to be understood. Now in Italian, one goes automatically to the beauty of those wonderful Italian vowels, which makes the sound legato and liquefied and mellifluous, and it is easier to sing than German. Yes. German is, I don't want to stress it too bluntly, but it is a more consonantal language. No question. And it's not brutal or harsh, but it is a firmer sound yes. that you make than in Italian. Mm -hmm. But then when you sing in French opera, and many American singers I know don't specialize in French opera, is it, do you think, because to pronounce the French language beautifully, automatically you have to close the sound a bit and become a bit more nasal. One doesn't want to do that, though, you know. I mean, in certain parts of the voice, you can do that. Then you get to other areas of the voice, you don't want to do that. Mm. You know, I mean, you don't want to over-emphasize uh, the fact that, well, that vowel is a very, very skinny-sounding vowel, and there's not much room for that sound to come through. I don't think that you want to do it like that. But most definitely, I would say, in in any language, before you even begin to sing it, you better speak it. Just talk it through. I'm not saying that you have to be entirely um, fluent, but you have to speak it. You have to pick up the nuances of the language. Mm -hmm. And and I say to, to, to young singers, why don't we just speak that through? Let's just not look at the notes now. Let's talk it. You know, and I think that I remember doing that with Hans Heinz always, and my, what a difference it made. You get the right conversational inflection that comes through then in the music. That's right. You get the way the language sounds before you even put notes to it, you know. And then, of course, you're helped with the composer who wrote for that specific language. Now, if you had your truthers, which <laughs> would your truthers sing, Italian, German, or French? Um, oh, dear. That, that's, a, that's a hard one. Um... You like them all the same. I do. I, I love uh, I love all the languages. Maybe that's why I'm I'm known for my versatility because I I do sing a lot of languages, including Russian, including Hungarian, mm -hmm. and including I'd like to add um, English with a Puerto Rican accent, which yes. was really quite a challenge. Well, we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> but this next question is one that has often been asked of singers. I think, and it indicates there is really a need for information on the subject. Roger Vogelein of Providence, Rhode Island asks, how can an aspiring young singer, one who's just starting out on a career, be certain he or she has the right teacher or vocal coach? Coach, yeah. Is it a matter of luck, personal chemistry, or what? I think, Richard, it's a matter of all of those things. A lot of hard work and dedication first. I can't emphasize that enough. And I think the luck and the, person, the personal chemistry are a part of it. I think it's very hard to be sure if you have the right teacher. And I think it comes down to a matter of trust. If you can find someone that you can trust in, whom you believe in, and who believes in you, I think that's the most important thing. And I was very lucky at the very outset of my career, and when I was a student at the Juilliard School, I met Mr. Hans Heinz, and mm -hmm. there was tremendous trust. He believed in me um, more than anyone, and, um, and I believed in him, of course, and, and that made for a wonderful relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's important to, 
to find that and to feel that trust. That's, that's what but I'm of course, talking about. Trust can sometimes be misplaced, you know. You were fortunate in putting your trust in the right person. But suppose uh, Mary Smith, you know, meets uh, John Jones, who mm -hmm. is a vocal coach. She works with him for two years. Mm -hmm. She feels finally she is getting nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, she feels that it's tiring to sing, her mm -hmm. throat mm -hmm. aches and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does she do? Does she have an outside person whom she also trusts, mm -hmm. listen to a lesson, mm -hmm. and then advise? Yeah, that's a good question, too. I think that if you are going to survive as a singer and are planning on having a long career and you're going to dedicate your life to this, that you have to start developing an instinct for what is right for you and for what is not, for what feels right and for what doesn't. When I first started to study, the first teacher I had thought that I was a contralto. Now there is, couldn't be anything further from the truth because I am not. And every time I'd leave that lesson, and how old was I? I was 19, my throat would ache. And clearly, you know, I said, That's a bad this sign. is naturally. This is, something's wrong here. And then, and then uh, students, I find, are very helpful. They'll, you know, I remember one particular student saying, Tatiana, you know, it's too dark, and of course your throat is aching because you're not a contralto, and, 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 and uh, so that's, of course... You were trying I, to sing in the basement, and there was oh, no coal down I'm there. I'm so glad I got out of the basement. Right, <laughs> because, you know, today you are a lyric mezzo-soprano, or I would even say a spinto mezzo-soprano, yes. and you could do dramatic roles, but I think you're wise because you avoid the real... Yes. Um, Head busting. Well, I try to, to, to combine them roles. also so that yeah. I'm just not, you know, like a dramatic mezzo soprano. And I love that you said, Richard, that I'm a lyric mezzo because that's really the way I feel. Well, it's uh, the way it sounds, too. It well, sounds that's, beautiful that's, all the that's time. That's what I'd like. That's right. good. Good. Now, here we have a thing about records. You have to hark back to when you were a child. <laughs> J.D. McClatchy of New York City writes that he has heard Victoria de Los Angeles first became <laughs> interested in opera after hearing recordings of Luisa Tetuzzini. And for Franco Corelli, it happened to be recordings of Enrico Caruso. Mm -hmm. Mr. <clears throat> McClatchy would like to know if, as a child, you were influenced by any recordings of past great singers. And if so, who were they? Fine. Well, I'd like to say, as a child, that I studied the piano. And my first music teacher was the first bassoon player of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra if you can believe that. It's a remarkable story. His name is Louis Petrini, mm -hmm. and he is the man that really taught me what being a musician is all about. And he taught me solfeggio, which is studying the rhythm, just, you know, various exercises in studying rhythm, as a conductor would. And after six months of doing that, he said, now we're going to form an orchestra, and what instrument would you like to learn? Now, I had that choice. So... Obviously, I, at that point, I was, I was only, what, 12 years old or something. I didn't say a singer. But in the back of my mind, I knew that I had some gift for singing. I said the piano. And this man was the first bassoon player, and his parts are still in the orchestra, mm -hmm. his, his um, bassoon parts, taught me the piano, taught all of us all the different instruments. Then I was only, I think, 12, and we started putting on what I would call musical plays, and I even helped make the costumes for it. So... You know, it was something that was certainly in my background. And I had a very dark sound and so forth. And finally, I went to Forest Hills High School and someone heard me in the chorus. It, it was a very large chorus and he searched for days. And finally he found me and he said, I have found you and you have to study. And I was rather shy and I really didn't think I had the potential. And I really was very serious about the piano. And he convinced me and he got me into the Juilliard Rep School. So that's how that started. And that's a tremendous amount of luck right there. It's so an advantage. I think, you know, do you still uh, use the piano in preparing I your roles? I certainly do. Yes, because you still can play. I certainly can. It works both ways, you know, because Vladimir Horowitz, for example, who's, as we all know, is one of the world's great pianists, uh, <coughs> is enamored of the recordings of Battistini mm -hmm. for the reasons of phrasing. And you got the same phrasing from learning the piano. That's right. <clears throat> yes. Well, that takes care of past great singers on record. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't really get to the, to the heart of that question. I would like to say, and I know that people have heard this a lot, and they say, oh, we hear this all the time from singers, the name of Maria Callas. There's no, there's no um, other woman that I can say, or artist that I can say influenced me as much as she did. And I just picked up her recordings. 
uh, when I was, what, I 16, I guess, mm -hmm. and just played them over and over and over again. And why? Why? I mean, what? Why? That's, that's a big it's question. It's one of those things you can't put your finger on. Well, it was everything. It was just like the total musician, the total, the phrasing, the personality, the temperament, the what she did with the language, what she did with the... She was a great musician. You know, and she was compelling. There wasn't any way you could not listen to this woman. Yes. And, and there, there it is, so. Well, good. So I'm glad I did answer that question. I yes. got to the, to the question. All right, now here's a very delicate question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like this question. Yes. <laughs> there has to be a special chemistry between a singer on stage and the conductor in the pit. Mm -hmm. Montepulli of Santa Ana, California would like to know, from your viewpoint, a singer's mm -hmm. viewpoint, mm -hmm. What makes a good operatic conductor, mm -hmm. and conversely, what makes a bad one? Mm -hmm. And Montepulli would also like to know <coughs> if you have a mental list of conductors with whom you have had one or more experiences that have led you to steer clear of them in future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> yes, I, one does have certain memories of certain performances, and you'd wish it gone a little bit differently. However, let's get to the conducting. I'd like to talk about good conducting, great conducting. And I think a good conductor has to love singers. I think that that's tremendously important. He has to know a singer's breathing. He has to know when a singer needs to be led and when a singer needs to be followed. I think that's very important. I myself need that very much more than anything, though. I need a strong conductor. I need a, a conductor who has a strong sense of theater. And I think the dynamics of the personalities are very, very important, the chemistry between the singer and the conductor mm -hmm. is tremendously important. You know, whether or not you can make music together, whether you're on the same wavelength about the style, you know, um, whether you, in fact, are really making music together. Or pulling against each other. Or pulling other. against each other, you know, and that's what you don't want, you know. And um, I've, I've worked with some absolutely fabulous conductors. Um, I'd like to talk about James Levine. I've done a lot of, lot of wonderful performances with yes. him. And, and he's a great, great conductor and a great man, and I'm very, very happy to have a wonderful collaboration with him that I do. You'll get no argument from any of us here about that. <laughs> Good. And then what makes a bad one? Well... You've indicated more or less. Right. All these things I've talked about, what mm. makes a good conductor, a bad conductor doesn't doesn't have these qualities. I mean, as I said, you have to love singers. You have to respect what they can do. You have to respect that they have an instinct and a knowledge that they also want to bring to a part. I mean, if a conductor totally ignores that and 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 just bullies his way through a piece and, and it doesn't have anything to do with anything or anyone, then, then that to me is not going to be a very inspired collaboration. Um, and especially if you are so diverse in the various styles Sometimes they are not, and sometimes they are great. Well, and of course, the conductor always has an advantage over a singer. He can wave that baton until mm, he's 90. That's right. And a singer's slender vocal cords mm. eventually give out, and that's there's right. no use wasting them, that's right. waiting for him to learn how to conduct. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, too, I feel a good conductor, a great conductor, he lets a singer sing, and he lets the orchestra play. Mm. You know, and when... I've just finished an engagement, as I recently did somewhere, and I said, you know that conductor with whom I worked, he didn't let those musicians play the way they should have played. He did, just didn't come out. He was constantly shushing them up. You know, I thought, as I was on the stage, I thought, why doesn't he just let them play? Yes, they instead can of clamping play. down on them. Yes, yes. and you know, that would be an example of someone I would not consider a good conductor, much less a great conductor. Well, that takes care of the conductors, and I think we came out on top as far as the good ones are concerned. <laughs> okay. Tatiana, I wish we could continue this indefinitely, but oh, our time, unfortunately, is up. The oh. final act of Verdi's Otello is about to begin. I can't thank you enough for being with us this afternoon. <laughs> this is Richard Moore returning you to Peter Allen in the Technical Broadcast Group. Thank you, Richard Moore. ...of the Metropolitan Opera. She has sung... 16 roles in the mezzo-soprano repertoire, and that includes or ranges over an enormous compass involving dramatic mezzo roles like Eboli, several roles in Wagner, and Adalgisa in Bellini's Norma, and at the other end of the spectrum, the famous trouser roles in the mezzo-repertoire, of which she will do one this year, the composer in Ariadna Vnaxas by Richard Strauss. 
Tatiana Troyanis, how do you feel about this role? Well, George, it's really the role that started my career. Um, in uh, 1967, I went to Aix-en-Provence, and it was the first time I didn't have to audition for, for, a, for a job, and sang with Régine Crespin. Paul Schoeffler was the music, music lehrer, the music teacher, and it was Paul who then got me to sing Ariadne, to sing the role of the composer at the Vienna State Opera. So this role did it for me. After, after these performances in Aix-en-Provence, so I feel very, very close to this young, impetuous composer, and I'm thrilled that uh, it's still in my repertoire today. It's a, it's a wonderful memory to have of a role that is rather unique in the sense that you virtually dominate the prologue part, yes. and then you disappear. Yeah. <laughs> so it gives you a thrill and regret, I imagine, at the same time. Yes, right? you know, Jim says that he misses me, you know, because yes. usually I'm, I'm, I'm certainly there for the entire evening, you know. But uh, uh, this is one of the few roles where I'm, where I'm finished in, in an hour. Yes. But the singing part itself is just 20 minutes, which, uh, I mean, it's a difficult 20 minutes, and it's an impressive 20 minutes, and you have to make the most of it, but then, then it's over, and... Uh, uh, but when you so say great. impressive 20 minutes, yes. uh, not the least of it is yeah. that you are glorifying music. Your, your words yes, all about absolutely. just what a great art music is. That's right, and I'm just thrilled to be able to stand there and sing those words on this wonderful stage. Yes. It's a thrill. And do you, because the role, has, it has been said that the role is really written with Mozart in mind. Oh, that yes. impetuous young yes, composer is yes, Mozart. Yes, yes, yes. And since you've done so much Mozart, yes. what were you Mozart? Um, Dora Bella, I imagine? Yes. And, uh, uh, um, Sesto, uh, which is yes. uh, Clemente and, and, uh, and uh, in my earlier years, I did a lot of Cherubinos. Yes. And, um, well, I mean, you know, I, well, and I've also sung Don Elvira. Yes, which that is I often loved. done by med Do you like that? Yes. Because it's it's it's, it's I would it's love difficult to do it for again. a mezzo to do. Yeah. That. Well, if you're on the if you have a high mezzo voice, you can yeah. manage it. But um, I would love to do it again. I really would, because the more Mozart one sings, the better. You know. Yes. Actually, German conductors have a preference for a mezzo Elvira. Do they? Yes. Yeah. Well, I should keep that in mind when I'm in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but now that you mention it, you are about to embark on a very important assignment in Vienna. Yes, George, I am singing my very first Octavian at the, uh, the Vienna State Opera, and I, I just think it's wonderful. It's, it's a, a role that I, I've always wanted to sing there, and I've been singing that role for, well, also 20 years. So. Yes. But somehow to do Rosenkavalier in Vienna yes. is a special challenge. Yes, I, it I is. Know. Yes. I imagine Octavian rates very high among your favorite roles too. Oh, it, it does. Is. It does. It was my debut here in 1976, mm. and it's played a, a very important part in my career. And I made my debut at Covent Garden in that role, and replacing, actually, Yvonne Minton at the time, mm. and only because she was going to have a child. Yes. And that's, you know, it was very difficult in those years to, to make a debut at Covent Garden. And, um, and that's how my relationship started then in England. And so I, it's been a great role for me. How does it uh, work out? Does it take a lot of uh, gear shifting mm -hmm. to go from a Hosenroller, from a impersonation uh -huh. of a young man yes. to someone really feminine like uh, Eboli, Amneris, yes. uh, I don't know, Delilah, whatever. It must take a, a whole... Yeah, re it does, a rethinking. Yes. Rethinking. Yes, yes, it does. Um, I think it came easier, actually, earlier on. Now it, it takes a lot more thinking and a lot more analyzing the part and what kind of gestures and how would she yes. look and how would she walk. And, and um, so, yeah, and I think about that much more than I used to because I interchange that so much. But I just got finished singing Ariodante, which is a marvelous, noble hero, one of Handel's later operas in Santa Fe. And um, it was... Well, I was costumed so beautifully. I didn't mm. have to do very much. I had to stand there and look handsome and feel, you know, um, like a hero, which I did, and, and, and sing the music as well as I mm. could. But um, it's actually more of an effort when I think about having to portray a role like Carmen again mm. 
after not having sung that role for 15 years, that would take an enormous amount of, of, of changing around. So I imagine it's really a matter of scheduling. If you are fortunate enough to stay in a certain typecasting, so to speak, yeah. uh, do a lot of feminine roles as a string, as a chain, yeah. and then set them aside, right. and then do the but Orlovskis. You, but even in this day and age, and with my kind of career, and with all the years I've been singing, I still cannot to do that. I can't say no. to my manager, you know, uh, if for the next six months, I don't want to do one rose right. roll. No, can't I can't do that. Do that. You can't. So you, you have to get used to that kind of change, right. you know. So this season, I'm doing the composer, and then followed by Octavian, which is fine. Yes. Then followed by uh, by Fledermels, so they're all... They're all Hosen Rollen. Hosen Rollen. Yes. And then followed by the, the Geschwitz. The Geschwitz, The yes. Geschwitz in Lulu, you know? Yes. And, um, but I think variety has been, for me... The, the key to whatever success I enjoy. You know, I think that I've needed that variety. I think it's remarkable. Well, thank you. And how do you feel about a role like Geschwitz? I mean, this is a Hosen roller That's with right. a vengeance. Yes, yes. Because the lady's, uh, yes. let's say, sexual orientation is at the very least uncertain. Right. But it is not really all that uncertain because depending on the on the stage direction, right. it's pretty well established that she likes ladies. Yes. And is that a special dramatic challenge, or does that depend on just how uh, explicit the stage director will be? I was to just going to bring in the stage director, and um, that's what's so important, that he watches me. And uh, John Dexter is the director for that, and he... I remember the first time I did it, he hardly said anything to me, mm. George. He just let me be. Yes. And he just said, stay still. That is, I think, what many smart uh, directors do, because uh, singers, actors, have their special instincts and special identification with the roles, and when they do something that goes contrary, I imagine, to the stage director's ideas, he should step in. Yes. But otherwise, sometimes surprising how many wonderfully individual ideas actors yes. can come up with. Yes, yes, yes. Um, apart from your uh, taxing but uh, enjoyable and delightful Metropolitan Opera assignments, and you mentioned Vienna, what other plans do you have for the current season in the United States? Uh, aside from Octavian in Vienna, I shall be singing some recitals in California and San Diego, and I'm doing also a master class in San Jose where a dear old friend of mine, Irene Dallas, is the head of the opera and vocal department at the San Jose University. And um, then uh, I shall be in Geneva singing Eboli and um. Verdi Requiems and recitals. And, and I do love singing in Geneva. And uh, so that will be my season. Wonderful. Your career is in high gear. I'm very fortunate. And right. I can understand that if an Eboli comes in right in the middle of all those <laughs> trouser parts, you are not going to say no to such a such a no, role. No, not to such a role. And there are more trouser parts to come. I'm, I'm looking at these wonderful Handel operas that are that have not been performed all that often. Yes. That if I have a chance to do them, I, I'm certainly going to do them because that uh, seems to have opened a whole new world for me. Discovering with my dear friend and coach. David Stivender, who, I mean, is absolutely marvelous, marvelous musician, and, and uh, he's, I work with him a great deal, and uh, we have looked at several Handel mm -hmm. scores, and I'm hoping to, uh, to do a lot more of that. It is remarkable that Handel is more popular today than he has ever been since the early wonderful? 18th century. Isn't that wonderful? Well, thank you very much, Tatiana Troianos. Very reluctantly, we have to say bye-bye <laughs> for a moment. Okay. Wish you a great success and continued great career. Thank you so much, George. My pleasure. Thank you. Marathon occasions of welcoming Tatiana Troianos. And here you are again. Greetings. Well, I'm Greetings. delighted to be here. Well, we are delighted to have you. We are going to hear an, uh, well, a scene from Aida in a moment from uh, Christmas Day 1976 we know oh, what you were doing wonderful yes exactly um, but uh, you obviously like holidays because uh, this New Year's <laughs> Eve you're singing <laughs> the Flater Mouse that's right and obviously that is a totally different sort of role I mean I can't imagine two that are more well, separated Bob I'll tell you I think my career has been based on different types of roles in extraordinary contrasts and this is certainly a very fine example 
But what does this do to you as a singer? Do you have to switch gears every so often? Or? It keeps me very busy. It keeps me on my toes. It, it um, affords me the opportunity really to work with wonderful people. And Otto Schenk and the cast that the Metropolitan Opera has for this Fledermaus is absolutely extraordinary. And I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Tatiana, that's a different thing. Of course you're thrilled. Of course it's exciting. Of course it's great. But it's also, as you said, so different. Yes, I know. So, so what but do I'm you used do? to that. You know, I'm used to it. All right, so it's a different score. So I pick it up. It's a different language. Fine, we're going to have dialogue in this production. I have to have a Russian accent. Fine. So I deal with all of that. I mean, you've got to deal with the elements as they're presented to you. And I love those kinds of challenges. And I think that that's really what's made my career very interesting. And I hope is the talent which will continue to give it some longevity. You know, I want it to go on for some years to come. And the fact that I can be so versatile is a plus in my favor, and it's something that I really love. Tell us about the uh, Orlovsky role. I mean... Uh... Well, I mean, he's a millionaire, and he's bored. He doesn't know what to do with his money. And he's rather sad, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that's how Otto Schenk has, uh, sees him, and I see him that way also. And uh, it's a great moment when finally he does laugh. And, um, um, and I, there's a lot of dialogue, and I do use a Russian accent, but it's not you know, exact. There isn't a Russian coach there every minute of the day saying, Tatiana, that's not right. <laughs> we don't want that, you know. I don't want to be bugged by someone correcting me every two seconds. But I want to use my own imagination and my own good ear for sound. And, and I love the challenge of that. I love getting up on the Metropolitan Opera stage and speaking. Well, actually... As an actress, I, you know. I wanted to ask you about that. We did a broadcast, <clears throat> uh, oh, quite a number of years ago now with Elizabeth Schwarzkopf. Did you? And she said one of the things, because she was singing operetta and recorded right, many, right. but she would not, Yes. she told us, mm -hmm. she would not mm -hmm. speak and sing at but the same this time. Is, this is very interesting, because Kiri has that same um, idea, and in many ways, of course, she's correct. You know, she's just finished singing, for instance, the Chardash. Okay, everyone knows this is an extraordinarily difficult piece. I mean, it goes up high, and it's, it's, it's very hard. And she doesn't want to speak right after it, because she feels that uh, I shouldn't be speaking for Kiri, Kiri's a dear friend of mine, and I'm sure she'll understand if we're talking about this particular point. And Elizabeth had that same kind of voice, you know, very, very fine-tuned, very, you know, I mean, it certainly it, it uh, carried and it was well-focused, but she had to be careful how she used it, and I think Kiri feels the same way. So after the childhood is over, she's supposed to say something, and she's asked, couldn't someone else say that? Because no one is going to hear me. My voice has now raised... The, the, the level, I mean, the pitch is so high that I can't get a decent sound so that my speaking voice will carry. Whereas I, you see, sing where I speak. Kiri does not, oh. neither did Elizabeth, right? Really, that's what that's I hope is going to carry me on into my <laughs> 60s or something, I don't know. But that's a very fortunate thing about being a mezzo-soprano, you know. I mean, I don't have that, that, that difficulty. How <laughs> differently do you have to project when you are speaking on stage than when you're singing? Well, this is interesting. We're going to find that out. You know, we've been rehearsing. <laughs> we've been rehearsing, you know, on sea level, and now we're on stage, and, and you see that enormous house, and you say, my goodness, you know, we've got to project. The uh, broadcast date for Flater Mouse is December 27th. Uh, you then will be uh, back on the broadcast for uh, Clemenza de Tito on yes. uh, Valentine's Day. You believe in holidays, don't you? <laughs> and then uh, uh, just before income tax day, April uh -huh, 11th, uh -huh. uh, Kundry in Parsifal. Yes. Does the hmm. idea of a broadcast put extra pressure on yes, you? Yes, of course, Bob. I think you know that. I mean, every singer wants a broadcast. Let's put it that way. Now every singer wants to be on television. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yes, it does. Of course. I mean, you're, you, you know how many people listen to the Metropolitan Opera broadcasts where there are millions and millions, and it's, it's wonderful. It's a, tra it's a tradition. It's so it's not so much adding nervousness as adding an edge of excitement. Adding an edge of excitement and being really, I mean, in your top form and, and um, we're trying to be, and uh, knowing that you're reaching out to millions of people. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this Tatiana, is what we're doing. Tatiana Trajanis, you have reached out today, I hope, to millions <laughs> of people. And uh, we thank you so very much as uh, we prepare now to listen to your uh, scene with Radames 
uh, the beginning of the judgment scene. And this, as we said, is from the broadcast of Christmas Day 19... Tatiana Troianos, we are concerned with Verdi in this, um, this year in the Metropolitan Marathon. But first, tell us about the Metropolitan itself and your feelings about this house. What's special about it? I mean, you sing all over the world. What's, what, what, uh, what makes this one stand out for you? Well, I think something that you love very much makes it stand out for you. And I love this company, and I love working here as much as I can. But why? What, what, what causes that there, feeling? There, there, is an, a, there is a wonderful electricity that I feel when I walk into this house. There's a great willingness, it seems to me, on everyone's part to put on the best performance that they can. And I will be celebrating, may I add, on March 8th, my 10th year at the Met, in 76... 1976, I made my debut in, in mm. Rosen Cavalier. And, um, and I'm so proud that I'm here for 10 years, and it's my home. It's, I'm a nesting person. I like roots, and, and I've got to feel comfortable, and, and I want that to be in one great opera house, and this is where it's at for me. So feeling comfortable in the house allows you to give your best as an artist. That's right. That's right. Because so often we find people rushing in, doing a performance, rushing out. Well, and you doing know, another one. you know, Bob. I've done that too. I've done that for years. But I don't think you do your best performances that way. And you know, also, let's say if I were now to go to Vienna next week, you know, it costs you in nerves. Even if you've had a success in the role that you've just sung somewhere else, you're singing it in another mm -hmm. opera house, and the acoustics are different. The way the opera house functions is different. I know the way this opera house functions. I'm a part of it. And I feel very much a part of it. And one of my friends, who's the first violist, Michael Uzunian, said the other day to a friend of mine, you know, Tatiana is really, this is her house. This is where she belongs. He didn't tell me that. He told someone else that. But it was just a feeling that you get after the years, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that it's not going to go on. I hope it will. That, that finally one does become... Uh, a part of this company, and I think it's a great company. You've mentioned a member of the orchestra. Yes, a friend and of mine. I, I suspect that in the general flair of opera, we think of singers, and we sometimes tend to overlook the contributions of the orchestra. Well, this don't. is major for you as well, this, this oh, group of artists that's absolutely. playing there. Absolutely. Yeah, they're all major for me, you know. The, the chorus, the orchestra, the conductors, the ballet, and and they all know me, and I know them, and mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's uh, it's um, a great ensemble house. I mean, how often are you going to get artists of any caliber? I don't care where in the world, after they've sung a performance as I did of Rosen Cavalier last night, and as many others have done before me, come in the next day and rehearse because there's a, ch a cast change. Mm -hmm. You know, but you need that. You need that in a great opera house. And that's what this is all about. It's always the small things, anyway, that add up to the big, to the big success. Tatiana, we're going to hear Eboli's aria from the Texaco Metropolitan Opera broadcast of Don Carlo. That was March 15th, 1980. And that same year, you also performed in a live from the Met telecast of the opera. What sort of... Well, extra pressure or possibly extra excitement do you get from doing a live telecast? Well, this is something that, first of all, I'm very glad that it's happening in my time. You know, there are, there are singers that say, you know, we really missed out because we didn't, we didn't have that opportunity. Mm, you know, course. it didn't happen to us. So I'm very lucky that... I have this chance to bring my interpretation and to bring myself into the homes of millions of people. So one is still very much aware of giving the best performance one can give. Um, one is very concentrated and, and it, in my view it doesn't change all that much because if you're working at your craft every day you know, and you're rehearsing and you're preparing for performances. It's um, it's part of what you do. It's like breathing, you know. 
and it is pressure, it's added pressure, but still the gratification of knowing that you're a part of this history and that you have a, you've made a film of an opera and that's going to be kept alive in an archive and, and, and it's a great satisfaction and it's something that, as I said, you can look at years from now and so can other people. And I'm, I'm grateful that, that I'm part of that and that it didn't come too soon, it didn't come too late for me. I think that's what makes me extremely happy. Now is the perfect time for you to get the up-to-date winter-spring Met ticket calendar. The calendar gives you complete and detailed information on a day-by-day -day basis on all Met performances from now until the end of the Met season, including all casting and remaining ticket prices. This free calendar is easy to get. Just drop a note with your name and address to Ticket Calendar, Box 50, New York, New York, 10023. Your ticket calendar will be your day-by-day -day guide to great opera at the Met. From now until the end of the Met's 101st season on April 20th. That address again is Met Ticket Calendar, Box 50, New York, New York, 10023.